Well, I'm bored. Let's see now, which button turns on the TV again? Whoa, what the? Uh, hey there, pal. Oh, Detective Gumshoe. Uh, wait, weren't you just a fictional character from my- Hey, Judge, I'm back and- Oh, no. Are you here to kill me or sell me something? Either way, get the hell off my ship. Wait, aren't you that guy from the Judge's fictional- Hey, pal. I got a couple of instant noodles in the microwave. You're ruining my dinner. Ugh, for the love of- <sighs> what the hell? I'm back here again? Oh great, another one. This place is becoming Grand Friggin Central. Is anyone gonna tell me what the hell is going on? Uh, excuse me, pal. I have a much more pressing matter. You owe me a cup of instant noodles. Uh, look, the teleporter needs charging, so why don't you both hang out while I discuss Turnabout Storm? Hmm, alright, I'm in. Alright, pal, I'm just gonna wait right over here. I think I'll take a nice nap. Well, as we can clearly tell from our friend's confused state, he's ready to begin the cross-examination. Phoenix Wright is teleported to Equestria to defend Rainbow Dash. Hold it! In true Phoenix Wright fashion, our prologue begins with us introduced to the victim and supposed murderer in silhouette, involving Rainbow Dash and Racer Ace Swift. Hold it! I would like to bring up some praise for this opening. I love the style it's used in. It's the classic Phoenix Wright style, of course, but I think the opening still could have worked even if the text wasn't there. Perhaps, but it does give you that classic Ace Attorney feel. Meanwhile, our favorite spiky hair defense lawyer suddenly whisked away to Equestria. An awkward first meeting ensues between him and Twilight, and she tells Phoenix that he was brought here because he is apparently the greatest defense attorney in the universe. And she needs him to defend Rainbow Dash, who's accused of murdering Ace. Hold it. That's a small problem I have with this series, and one of the only ones I have for it, really. The setup, for me, kind of feels forced. Just with the whole him getting swept away to this place he doesn't know about for some unknown reason. In short, I just wish they would have spent a bit more time on setting it up. But really, that's just a nitpick compared to the whole plot. Well, as long as it gets the story rolling, I can let it go. Anyway, upon arrival, he is hesitant at first, but after discovering Rainbow's not lying through the Magatama and displaying his own sense of loyalty, reminiscing back to his own classroom trial, he agrees to defend her and begin the investigation. Already, this feels like a Phoenix Wright game. Visually, it uses concepts and graphical assets including text box intros before each scene, utilization of cues of evidence, or assets from the game including music and sound effects. There's dynamic scene shifts moving from one part of the area to another, like when Phoenix and Twilight are investigating the crime scene, or being able to see the point of fight areas of the game like the courthouse and its lobby. Hold it! Yeah, I praise the videos for their use of concepts used in the games, as well as the concepts from the show, such as the Pegasi being able to move clouds being used as evidence. But the big, or I guess it could be a little problem for me, is that to me some of the art in the videos do look kind of shabby or simplistic. I just think they could have gotten better art for it. I enjoy the fact that they took that little aspect from the games. That clues that seem underwhelming now really do lead to the end game, such as the stick or the second lightning bolt. But the overall artwork and presentation does improve over this five-part series. Anyway, after the search of the crime scene, the two find minimal clues and prepare for the trial that turns out to be sooner than intended. The trial of Rainbow Dash for the murder of Ace Swift begins. Hold it! Choosing Trixie as a prosecutor was the perfect antithesis to rival Phoenix, and Twilight for that matter. She perfectly represents the overconfident and calculating personality of Francisca von Karman, even copying her trademark fist slam. Hold it. This is the other problem I have with this series. Trixie's bias against both the attorney's co-counsel and the suspect would, if this were a real-world courthouse, get her held in contempt. Not only that, but though I'm just taking a shot in the dark here, I'm pretty sure that the prosecutor making fun of the attorney would also at least get a warning. As well, in a real courtroom, the prosecutor would need to back up their evidence with proof. Well, in true Ace Attorney fashion, that kind of behavior is pretty common, with the prosecutors constantly berating or mocking the defendant or witness, as they are typically seen as the bad guys. So while this realistically wouldn't happen in a real court case, I think it feels right at home with the Phoenix Wright series. Moving on, this also sets up her revenge plot for Twilight for her previous encounter during Ghostbusters, where since then she's been constantly heckled and mocked at every show since the Ursa Major incident and still holds that deep-rooted hatred of her. It's a perfect casting choice. Speaking of casting, I guess we'll discuss the voice acting, which was great across the board. I'll 
while giving great deliveries in this relatively large cast of characters. And as the trial begins, it seems that the judge has also been teleported from Japan, er, I mean the United States. And as always, he's a pretty fickle judge, always flip-flopping, kind of eccentric god personality, just like our judge. What? I've never... God, what have I ever done to make you ever doubt me? Maybe a nice gambling will change your mind. My point exactly. Hold it. Yeah, I can agree. The characterization of not just Trixie, but all the main cast seems to be really well laid out. Even with them alluding that there is more to Trixie than we know. And yeah, I can agree. I guess the judge in any dimension is flip-floppy and kind of useless to the protagonist. Yeah, I, I think it's time I introduce you to my friend, Mr. Gavel. Ow! Uh... uh... Where did you send him? How the hell am I supposed to know? I just send them. Where they end up is of no care to me. Interesting. <laughs> Well, to continue on from that, the voice acting was a bit off in the first few parts, but I do admit it gets better as time goes on. During the trial, we learn more about the victim of Pegasus who, like Rainbow Dash, was to compete in the Equestrian 500, a 500 mile race across Equestria, and with two such egos competing, it unfortunately establishes a pretty strong motive for Rainbow. The Pegasus in question was killed apparently by a bolt of lightning from a storm cloud that Dash supposedly set off. Throughout the first day, we hear conflicting testimonies from Apple Bloom and Fluttershy, all the while including references from the game. This is one of the main reasons I know the producers are true fans of the Ace Attorney series. We see little references from the series such as the stepladder joke or the box reference from Turnabout Samurai or Wapniar's cameo akin to Furio Tigre, just to name a few of the many references strewn throughout. More on this fanworks writing, which throughout this five-part series is pretty solid. The dialogue does a good job of capturing every character's personality, maybe a little too much in some cases, as at times Pinky does get a little unbearable at some points, but her role is limited, so it's not too bad. Phoenix himself is probably the best written character in this crossover, perfectly capturing the resourceful, laid-back wimp he is in the games. Most of his interactions lead to awkward, funny situations. Speaking of humor, there are a lot of funny jokes in Turnabout Storm, most of it stemming from those awkward situations, but we see characters, for example, like Twilight in full-on adorable bookworm mode, or her spurts of OCD. Or Fluttershy thinking that he's an actual phoenix, and there are, of course, the hair jokes to last miles. Though, the jokes are sometimes annoying, especially to people who have never seen Phoenix Wright before. They wouldn't get the references or a lot of the jokes, but I will admit that the jokes, even if one has never seen Phoenix Wright, were very funny and got plenty of chuckles out of me. Just the references get a bit intrusive and do sometimes feel like padding. I personally didn't find such references too intrusive as they did play along with the story. Going back to the box reference, it was a quick little fun moment, but I can't see how non-Ace Attorney players can see such moments as questionable. And though there are great lighthearted moments, there are just as many dramatic moments as well. There's constant back and forth witty repartee from both parties building the tension as Phoenix is always hinging on the guilty verdict. The many twists and turns in the trial leave the audience guessing constantly how things will play out, and overall playing a well-written court drama. The first day, Phoenix buys some time, much to the chagrin of Twilight with him, casting suspicion on Fluttershy. Tensions are high between Twilight and Wright, and Fluttershy and Rainbow with her seemingly damning testimony, but no time to spare as the second day of investigation begins. Phoenix and Twilight begin their solo investigations in Ponyville. Hold it! Immediately following the trial, Phoenix and Twilight go their separate ways, and what follows is a well-coordinated set of divergent storylines, each encountering their own misadventures. Hold it! What? Eh, I got nothing. Gah. Each scenario includes different events that are set up in one part and pays off in the other, such as in the Phoenix scenario, derpy wards of a mean unicorn running around town, which we assume is Trixie, but we find out it was actually Twilight accidentally insulting the bubbly mare in her scenario. It's difficult to pull off diverging storylines as all parties need to meet up at the exact same time, with events occurring simultaneously, but the writers executed it perfectly. I also like how Phoenix walks around town, he's seeing various ponies he comes across in relation to his own world, such as seeing Applejack as Lotta Hart with her southern drawl, or mysterious newcomer Sonata who bears a resemblance to Mia Fey, his former mentor. Naturally, he tries his breast to break the illusion, and I mean, he, he doesn't want to come off as a boob. It's very titillating when Mia's on screen and- oh, forget it. Hold it! I guess I could find a bit more of a problem. From a storytelling perspective, they fail at introducing new characters by just having the ponies randomly bump into said character, such as Cruise Control and Twilight quite literally bumping into each other. It just seems a bit ham-fisted to me. Then again, true to Ace Attorney, Phoenix does tend to run into wacky characters as he goes along his investigation, so while out of nowhere, it still feels true to the game's spirit. Back to Sonata, Ace's manager, who's a very cold and calculating individual 
individual who is more reminiscent of the smug, collective personality of Adrian Andrews from Farewell My Turnabout, even inheriting her eye for detail, holding all the cards, making her intelligent and dangerous. Speaking of Farewell My Turnabout, though, the project is an amalgamation of so many different elements and references from the Ace Attorney series. In terms of its characters and plot elements, Turnabout Storm does seem most similar to that last case from Justice for All. Hold it. I'm just going to say that Sonata's character works so well with the story, and by the end, I'm not surprised she was the puppeteer behind everything. Even when she's found out, she's able to keep her calm and cool demeanor. And I love the prospect of her trying to hide her true self behind her glasses, even if she didn't need them. Another great aspect is that there's actually a fair amount of character development in this crossover, including Trixie's deep, unrequited emotional distress. The events from both Busters and subsequent disdain from her showgoers, including history with Sonata, sets up a real emotional backstory. We'll come back to that later, as it seems Phoenix is getting a call. Stop that dancing at once, Code. Can't. Must. Fresh dance. Just get on with it. It seems that Phoenix has contacted Go to the crime scene for an opportunity to gather more evidence, but he has to go it alone. It's a trap! Turnabout Storm, for the most part, isn't too heavy on animations, mostly replicating the minimal lip-syncing scene in the games. Though during the project's production, we do see improved animations on ponies. Here, though, is one of the series' examples of a full-motion animation sequence. Though it is short, it is a nice element making the moment feel more dynamic. Hold it. While I do agree with you that the animation style is interesting and follows the game fully, I do enjoy when animators pull off the kitty gloves and show us exactly what they can do, such as in the Twilight explaining teleporting scene. It shows just how much pride the animator has for his work. Anyway, after the attack, Wright is rescued by Fluttershy for giving him for casting suspicion and discovering it was a Quest 500 racer, Cruise Control, who attacked him. They finish their day of investigation, gathering various clues, and the friend prepare for the trial. Day 2 of the trial of Rainbow Dash begins. Hold it! So our heroes are still riding close on that guilty verdict, as we get more witnesses including a surprise appearance by Gilda, and Noah King knocks it out of the park with her performance as the ordinary griffin, and probably has not only the most, but best overall dynamic animations, especially this one. Hold it! Yeah, Gilda's character is for once actually used appropriately here. And Hasbro, take a letter! This is how you do a redemption arc right. You allow the character to both forgive and be forgiven. As the trial continues, shenanigans ensue, but eventually leads to a remorseful moment between her and Dash. Redemption arcs in the Ace Attorney series have been mixed. Some rightfully earn forgiveness, being lost and emotionally traumatized, not knowing what to do, and doing only what they can do to survive. And then there are those who essentially rush through and basically hand wave their guilt of their crimes, earning no sympathy, and then there's just evil. Of all the redemption scenes in Turnabout Storm, I'd say Gilda's is probably the weakest and least forgivable. She does possess an ambivalent relationship with Dash, growing up with her and bonding during Junior Speedsters, and then their eventual fallout during Griffin the Brush Off. Basing things on the outcome of her life following that episode and Turnabout Storm's constructed continuity, she's really suffered no negative repercussions where nothing has affected her life distancing herself from Dash. Gilda claims she did have intentions to at least try and patch things up with Rainbow, but upon arriving to the crime scene, she suddenly decides to screw her over with those Griffin the Brush Off memories resurfacing. The three antagonists here are trying to find Rainbow Dash guilty of murder, but Trixie has a deep emotional hatred over Twilight and her friends, warranted with how they acted through the show mirror, and Sonata was in a lost place conflicting over her horrible life she's lived, and Gilda was simply told off by her friend. Her MO is basically letting Dash die because they don't like each other. Though at least she's not as bad as Acro. Yeah, it seems the best bits of the series in general are the emotional backstories of their original characters that we are both told about and see, such as Cruz's backstory with his sister and Sonata's whole thing, they just all click. Exactly, I love how the secondary characters have their own fair amount of character development and backstories. They could have been simply just to be one-dimensional characters to push the plot forward, but we develop an emotional attachment to the characters like Cruz and a medical condition with his sister. It's very well done. Anyway, back to the trial, we finally bring Sonata to the stand, and during her cross-examination, it looks as though she was the one responsible, thus acquitting Dash. However, as in the nature of Farewell My Turnabout, Phoenix isn't satisfied letting the legitimately remorseful Sonata be tried for murder. She's been living such a shameful life hurting and extorting ponies for profit, but realized how wrong she was and willingly wanted to leave that life. Convinced she had killed him, Sonata was scared and lost, and she did the only thing she could do to survive and implicate Rainbow Dash. Her actions were depraved, but feels like a realistic scenario for someone in her position. 
Before the trial, she relies on her mask of deception to hold weight over her opponents. However, her facade breaks, realizing that she isn't perfect, suffering from her errors, and regretting her crime. Hold it. This is a problem for me with Ace Attorney games in general. Why exactly does the attorney, in this case Phoenix, have to find the true murderer? Isn't his job simply to make sure his client is not guilty? Isn't it up to the police force to find the true killer? It's Phoenix Wrightland! Don't question it. However, that is a burden that is put upon the player regardless of the prosecution being able to establish an alibi or motive, Phoenix must always be the one to answer the questions. A little tedious, but again, seeing it here is kind of akin to the game's nature. The truth is soon uncovered that it was Ace that ended up killing himself. So in the end, Phoenix saves the day, Dash is acquitted, and Sonata receives a lighter sentence. We see a nice scene of Fluttershy and Rainbow Dash reconciling, as Dash was out of line, regretting yelling at her, and we finally come full circle on Trixie's redemption arc. As we learn from Sonata, Trixie has been an egotistical braggart who's been wearing her mask her entire life. We see a break throughout the series as signs of her insecurities appear when her arguments are shot down, and even refers to herself in the first person. Following Ghostbusters and the terrible turn her life has taken, does have the potential to set up a good revenge redemption plot. However, the problem is, and its payoff. During the trial, Trixie doesn't even bat an eyelash to Rainbow Dash being banished to die. Even after the first guilty verdict, Trixie shows not even an ounce of remorse. So like Gilda, her redemption arc doesn't feel very warranted, and though her and Gilda's redemption arcs weren't well executed, the story's overall moral is good, a tale of second chances, allowing those who may have wronged you a new outlook on life, all the while letting go of the emotional turmoil both possess and moving forward. Hold it. And the ending is freaking hilarious. The fact that, for one, Phoenix did this pro bono, and the fact that Trixie, of all people, is the one who pretty much got rewarded in the end, is possibly the funniest ending they could have used. But there is one elephant in the room that we never brought up in this review, and that is Celestia. How the hell does she know about Phoenix? It makes no sense. Well, it's actually somewhat answered in the epilogue of the last part. However, the conversation between Celestia and who we find out later is Mia is a little vague. Mia tells Celestia all about Phoenix and that he'll defend Rainbow Dash. However, why and how Mia went to Equestria's dimension and found out about this whole murder trial is never really explained. But in the end, though there are some problems with this project, great voice acting, humor, and the majority of the writing was well done. The case itself is one of the most tight-knit cases from beginning to end. I didn't see any major logical flaws, all the evidence was well used, and there weren't any sudden plot twists that seemed intrusive to the overall story. I would say it even rivals many of the game's cases, which some possess great illogical leaps in logic or plot holes. All in all, a solid case to wrap up an awesome crossover. Yeah, for me, this series was absolutely epic. And one of the first Bernie related things I had ever seen. So despite its problems, I can definitely recommend this to just about anyone who loves Phoenix Wright, even if they aren't a Brony. I give this 10 awesome Sonata breaks out of 10. Though, be warned, if you get into this series, it is fucking long, clocking in at just about 9 hours. Be prepared for a long story. Ah, perfect. Alright, you guys ready? Yeah. Oh, wait. Hey, uh, Judge. Um, uh, you okay? Let us never speak of this again. Alrighty, um, so, uh... Hey, what about my dinner, pal? I expect a full refund. Uh, yeah, my uh, co-counsel says that he'll cover you. Why the hell would I do that? Alright, pal, hand over those bits. Go to hell. Oh, you just don't understand who you're dealing with. <laughs> you fucking moron. God, you're so stupid. Uh. Hmm. Where do you think that detective went? Who cares? As long as he's out of my main, I'm happy. Hey, I wonder where I'm at now. Ooh, what's that over there? Uh, I didn't do it. Even if the... I'll keep that in. <laughs>